They'll probably even appreciate it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Don't do it. No. Just before we get started, I do want to tell you about today's video sponsor, which is Crossout. Crossout is an online vehicle shooter game where all of the vehicles are player made. And by that, they don't mean you can go in there, you know, you load it up and it's like there's four vehicles to choose from and you could choose the type of ammunition. None of that sort of player made. No, with Crossout, it's like you're in a garage and then they give you like the base of the vehicle, but like... It's not really even a base. It's just like a piece of metal that you build onto. The customization is insane and the stuff I've built in Crossout and more the stuff that I've taken my vehicles out onto the battlefield and I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> there are people who are a lot more creative than me. People like rolling around in these huge tanks with all these like weird bits off there, like a Gatling gun stuck on the top, like a chainsaw. It's, uh, you can really pretty much do whatever you want with your vehicle. It's not just choosing the ammunition. It is you build it from the ground up. It's pretty crazy. It's free to play on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. No purchase necessary. Simply download and play for free. You have complete freedom of creativity. I think I, I got that in with how much you can customize it. It's pretty incredible. There is a huge arsenal of parts, weapons, drives, trains, support systems, structural parts, decorative elements, and loads of customization options such as paint jobs. Yeah, like I said, you really do totally make it your own. You make a craft. Uh, I mean, the disadvantage is if you make it badly, <laughs> you'll take it out there and some people will just absolutely destroy you. But then you live and you learn. Sometimes I've made it, it's like, oh, it doesn't really even work properly. <laughs> Well, this gun doesn't work. So you go back, you take it to the garage, you fix it, and boom. It's very easy to get into. Like, I don't, I'm a busy dude. I don't spend like a ton of time playing video games and like getting deep into cross out. I just like it for like a quick break in the day. I go in, boom, go out, smash some people up, and then get on with the rest of my day. It's like uh, arcade or whatever, you know, much quicker and fast paced. But I am told that if you uh, spend more time in the game, you know, you really you can develop your skills and get a lot better at it, and the game kind of grows with you, which is nice. They also have an open world campaign, which I've not actually played, but I probably should so I can talk about it more in the next advert. <laughs> Also, it looks incredible. You'll be seeing some footage on the screen now, so you don't need to describe how great it looks. You can see that for yourself. So go through my link below. You'll get an exclusive bonus, which is unique pixel paint, as well as a choice between a selection of three weapons and a powerful vehicle cabin. Again, there is a link below to get access to all of that stuff. And as I mentioned, it is totally free to play. So why not enjoy and now today's video? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon. I'm here. De no, 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 Kevin. Kevin, regular guest author slash pretty much regular contributor now, Kevin. You've weaseled your way into the blaze. Congratulations. Lots of people email me wanting to do this, and somehow you've done it. Bravo, old chap. Let's just crack on. If you're new here, uh, Kevin has written me a script. I've never read it before. We're going to read it together and explore. Uh, I accidentally skipped the title. Scroll up, teleprompter. Scroll up. Movies with questionable moral messages. Oh no, I did read it, didn't I? And then I then I immediately forgot about it because that's the sort of big brain that I am. Let's go. People are stupid. Impressionable jerks. Television and movies are filled with moral messages to capitalize on our impressionable stupidity and try to make us better people. Sitcoms are notorious for this. Growing up, it was impossible to watch a 22-minute episode of a show without being exposed to eight minutes of commercials and a long diatribe designed to teach us how to be better to one another or some other preachy bullshit. Yes, Kevin, just ignore those moral messages. Get on with the story. Unagi. Also, it is insane how much advertising we had to watch. Like, good lord. I'm just like, now I do not watch adverts. I do not. And I know you do. And you watch my sponsors. Thank you. No, and I, to be fair, I do watch YouTube, so I see adverts there. I mean, sponsorships, not adverts. I pay for premium because of course I do. And, and it's just insane that we'd sit through eight minutes for 22 minutes of TV. Christ. Back forward, back forward, back forward! <laughs> But sometimes the messages completely miss the mark or are just completely bizarre and question people's reality. The writers may not have even intended to include any sort of mora moral morale. <laughs> morale. What, what? What is wrong with you? Me. I mean, what's wrong with me? Why am I so broken? Instead of thinking they were just being cute or funny. Intentional or not, these movies had very clear messages that people almost certainly weren't prepared for. Big Top Peewee. Oh, let's also play the game of which of si which has Simon heard of and which has he seen? Big Top Peewee? Never seen, never heard of. Okay, let's go. I enjoyed Peewee Herman as a kid. What the f*** is Peewee Herman? This is one of those things where I'm like, 
this is an American thing. This is for Americans. And then British people will be like, oh, Simon, you've never heard of Pee Wee Herman. But, but Big Top Pee Wee is a garbage movie that makes little sense. A storm comes through town and it blows an entire traveling circus onto Pee Wee's farm. Also, Pee Wee owns a farm now for some reason, rather than pulling out his shotgun and telling everyone to get the hell off his property, as is the American way. Pee Wee instead befriends the ringmaster and falls in love with the trapeze artist who is the circus's main attraction. This is already problematic because Pee Wee had a fiance. The girls find out about one another and are justifiably enraged, so he does the only sensible thing and breaks off his engagement engagement to be with the person he met just two days ago. For some reason, I was assuming this was a kid's show, and I guess it's not a kid's show. Just pee-wee. <laughs> Sounds like it's for kids. As messy and inappropriate as all of this is, the horrible moral of the movie has nothing to do with his romantic life. Really? He ran away? He was engaged, and he's like, nah, I like that circus performer instead. <laughs> I mean, I guess that can't be the moral message, but it certainly is a moral message. To impress his new love, Pee Wee decides to perform a tightrope act, tightrope act at the circus in honor of her late father. The only problem is that the entire town is crotchety old people who hate the circus and wanted to get the hell out of town. The town sheriff even comes to arrest Pee Wee, though he promises to drop the charges if the circus leaves. What is our wacky hero to do oh, when faced with such adversity? Well, it turns out that Pee Wee is sort of an inventor and a mad scientist, so he gets hot dogs from the magical hot dog tree that he is genetically engineered and feeds them to the town's residents. I call this the hot dog tree because, well, it's a hot dog tree. What the f*** is actually going on? The hot dogs turn them all into children with no memory of what had been happening so everyone can finally enjoy the circus. How many f***ing mushrooms did you eat before writing this writer of this absolute f***ing dribble? Allegedly. Get your shit together. I... This is insane. This is insane. I could sketch out the plot to a movie that is that is this insane in about five minutes. And yours got made into a movie and I'm sure you got really well paid. What the f*** is this? It's ridiculous. Daddy, chill. The moral of this story is that if people disagree with you, it's okay to poison them with reality-altering substances so that they forget who they are and where they are so that you can get your way. It's no surprise that when Pee Wee faced an admittedly ridiculous and undeserved scandal, Bill Cosby was one of the few celebrities to defend him. I- okay. I don't know what's going on, but- <laughs> Bill Cosby, what are you up to? If Bill Cosby's now out of prison, right? Because there was some technicality thing, which is like- <laughs> We really want that? We want Bill Cosby out there? Allegedly? It's weird. It's, it's, it's Bill Cosby. Shh. You're in town. Let's just assume this one isn't for kids. As a movie, this is either in production or in development hell, but the musical has been out for over 20 years, so we know the plot. The inspiration for You're in Town came when an American who was traveling through Europe encountered a pay toilet, something that doesn't exist over here. Yeah, we talked about this before, and I kind of think, like, pay toilets get the thumbs up from me because well then you're using money to you know so people don't you know there's the, the people to pay to tidy them up and stuff and you also keep people out who are maybe gonna you know use it and i'm not you, you it's very hard not to sound like a person when i'm like well, i don't want a homeless person taking a shower in the sink in the public toilets and i mean i don't want that what i want is for them not to need to do that by having a proper society that takes care of homeless people i gotta pee but i also don't want to be having a slash while a man is shirtless and trouserless and washing himself up in the toilet just splashing water all over the floor and all of this stuff because i just don't i'm sorry i don't i just don't neither do you if you're honest about it but i really gotta go <sighs> The story is set in a dystopian future that is experiencing a 20-year drought. Homes are no longer allowed to have private toilets, and all of the public pay toilets are controlled by the evil mega corporation UGC, or You're in Good Company. Oh, you're in good company, but a bub bub dumb! The toilets are prohibitively expensive, but there's no alternative. Anyone caught urinating in public and is, is, is arrested and taken to urine town. Though the people have created some sort of mythos surrounding urine town, believing it's a magical land where you can pee anywhere you like. In reality, though, it's just authoritarian doublespeak for we're going to throw you off a skyscraper and kill you. Oh, good. Love that. Love dystopia. 
In the second act, UGC decides to raise the fees on the public toilets yet again, but this time it's too much for people to bear. They revolt and overthrow the evil UGC corporate company corporation, making the toilets free for public use. Peeing is once again a right rather than a privilege. There was just one problem. Without the steep fees and draconian punishment, people were free to urinate and thus drink as much as they wanted. In the middle of a drought that had already lasted for 20 years, this was not ideal. This movie has a huge plot problem. Droughts aren't caused by people drinking too much. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's just not how it works. Within two weeks, the water was gone and everyone was dead. The moral of this story is that you're too stupid to take care of yourselves, and supposedly evil corporations exist to prevent you from literally dying to your own stupidity and short-sightedness. Which, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with. <laughs> To be fair, the writer was at least half right. 40 Days and 40 Nights. Oh, I've seen this one. First one I've seen, this is that, is it Ashton Kutcher? Where he's like, he's celibate for like 40 days and 40 nights and something happens. That's all I remember about it. Billed as a satirical and erotic romantic comedy, the movie 40 Days and 40 Nights is the sort of movie I'd expect to have come straight out of the 1980s. Somehow, however, this piece of trash was, I want to say it's like 1999. It feels like very American Pie era doesn't it maybe a couple of years after that oh one maybe somehow this piece of trash was released in oh it's close it's 2002. the movie revolves around matt a web designer from san francisco who is too obsessed with his ex-girlfriend to be able to perform with other girls in the bedroom the obvious solution would be for him to just think about her while in bed with those other girls but then the movie wouldn't happen and the world would be a better place <laughs> Anguished over his. Tell me if this is starring Ashton Kutcher. I think it is, but I'm not sure. Anguished over his sexual dysfunction, Matt seeks the counsel of his brother, who is training to be a Catholic priest. That's where you should go for advice on sexual matters the Catholic Church. <laughs> Don't do that. That was a. That was a joke, especially if you're a young boy. That's no good thus making him the least qualified person to handle this sort of issue. Matt learns that his ex is now engaged, so he decides to give up both sex and masturbation for Lent, thus the title of the film. Hilarity ensues on day one of his abstinence when Matt meets a new girl at the laundromat. The two really hit it off, but he has to awkwardly avoid intimacy rather than doing the sensible thing and just explaining that he gave up sex for Lent. His co-workers have also started a betting pool to see how long Matt will last. This is not entirely unrealistic, but it's a little silly when the pool goes online and reaches a total of eighteen thousand dollars yes because people don't care no one would care it's that like i gave up sex for then okay good for you mate all right that sounds shit. <laughs> of course this has to happen so the new girl can discover the bet his abstinence and his feelings for his ex to create unnecessary drama i feel when did viagra come out <laughs> Matt's co-workers continually try to sabotage him so that he can so that they can win the bet with one attempt to spike his drink with Viagra, but hitting the wrong target instead. Wait, so he can't perform in the bedroom and he's like, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask my Catholic brother about what to do, rather than just you know <laughs> Viagra. <laughs> and that's not even close to the worst part. With only a few days left of Lent, Matt's ex breaks up with her fiance that was cheating on her and goes to see Matt, but he turns her away. The next day, she finds out about the bed amongst his co workers. Having already been turned down on the rejection, she puts down $3,500 of her own money for the bet, and she is determined to win no matter what. On the final day, Matt is having a really rough go of it. He has plans to have sex with his new girlfriend at midnight, and the final wait is proving to be more than he can handle. This doesn't sound like a great way to reduce the pressure of, um, like, he's having trouble performing in the bedroom because he's like, there's too, you know, he keeps thinking about his ex. Is having, is, is giving up sex for 40 days. I mean, that's going to add some serious pressure, my dude. <laughs> To make sure he doesn't break his vow, he has his roommate handcuff him to the bed so that he can't self-gratify before his girlfriend comes over. Unfortunately, being handcuffed to a bed is boring, so he falls asleep. He wakes up to discover his ex, who's never returned her key to his apartment, finishing up on top of him. She also timed it so that his new girlfriend would see her leave the apartment, forcing Matt to apologize for cheating on... Uh, oh my god. Is this? I don't remember this in the movie, but is she... Uh, uh, is this... Uh, if you somehow aren't disgusted, swap everyone's genders and then tell me how you think this would go over. <laughs> we already got there, Kevin. We already got there. The moral of the story is that rape... Oh, I don't think we can say that on YouTube. I think you have to say... Well, can you? I don't know. I hear some people bleeping it out. I hear some not. Whatever. Rape. 
Uh, and to the genius YouTube algorithm, I mean, we're talking about rape seed, the, the plant rape seed, which makes rape oil. <laughs> oil? No, oil. Uh, oh my god, stop making jokes. Let's carry on. The moral of this story is that is an acceptable tool for winning a bet and has every place in a comedy movie. I mean, it worked for Revenge of the Nerds. Never seen Revenge of the... <coughs> Never seen Revenge of the Nerds, so I don't understand that reference, but uh, it's... Oh, god damn. Love Actually. Love Actually is a 2003 psychological thriller. No, it's not. I've seen this one. It's a romantic comedy. It should be anyway, but the music in the movie is cheerful instead of ominous and suspenseful, so it builds an anthology of love stories set around Christmas time. This is mad popular. I don't know if this this is a British movie. This is mad popular in the UK. It's like, it's a Christmas movie for us. People watch this all the time. I'm not sure I've ever seen it all the way through. It's like one of those ones that comes onto TV and you watch a bit of it, then you watch a bit of it another, another time, and this sort of thing. This framing of the movie works masterfully, so long as nobody pays attention to what is actually going on. This movie is set in London, a city in which women are apparently better seen and not heard. Yes, finally, Peter! Multiple segments feature a man falling in love with a woman despite never talking to her, and in one case, despite not even speaking the same language. The men go on to do creepy things like sharp uninvited at the woman's home or at her second job, places they shouldn't even know the location of. Arguably the most, I don't remember this at all. I mean, it's been a very long time. Um, so I don't remember any details about this movie, other than a fairly substantial cast. There are a lot of famous people in this. Arguably the most egregious of the segments stars Kira Knightley, there we go, and Andrew Lincoln. Uh, I don't know Andrew Lincoln. Better known as Rick from The Walking Dead, I do know Andrew Lincoln! Oh yeah, he's in the credits! Of course! Ding ding! Isn't he American? Or is he just British playing American? As a fun aside, Lincoln's real name is Clutterbuck, a name that sounds like an angry child tried to invent their own swear word. Really? Clutterbuck. Wow, that's a name and a half. I feel like that's very memorable, but it's not quite movie starish, is it? Andrew is the best friend of Kira's fiance, both of whom believe Andrew hates her because he never talks to her, only to her fiance. He is conscripted into filming their wet. Wait, what? Andrew is the best friend of Kira's fiance, both of whom believe Andrew hates her because he never talks to her, only to her fiance. Oh, okay, so he's just talking to his mate rather than his mate's fiance. Got it. I think the movie's probably like, because he fancies her. Uh, he is conscripted into filming their wedding video, but never hands it over to the couple. Months after the wedding, Kira goes to Andrew's house to retrieve the video herself because she's sick of waiting for it. Kira pops the video into the VCR and begins watching. As the wedding begins, she's thrilled to see how pretty she and her dress look, but she starts to notice something. The video is nothing but extreme close-ups of Kira's face throughout the entire wedding and reception. <laughs> Dude, that is creepy as f <laughs> Maybe I haven't seen this movie because I don't remember this at all. As the video approaches its end, its end, she turns to a visibly embarrassed and distraught Andrew and says, They're all of me. After a moment of tense silence, she leaps towards the door, but Andrew blocks her path while brandishing an axe. Forget it, I've never seen this movie. I would remember this. Oh, okay, I made that like... <laughs> Kevin now says, okay, I made that last bit up, but that's absolutely what should have happened in this scene. Instead, Andrew tells of the fact that I didn't know that this didn't happen. Um, also says that I don't think I've seen this, or at least I've only seen bits of it. Instead, Andrew tells her that he has a lunch appointment and she can see herself out before saying that being so cold to her was self-preservation. Andrew is worried about filming the final scene of their story because he recognized that it may have come off as him being a creepy stalker. He kept bringing it up to the writer-director who assured him that it would be fine. It was absolutely not fine. <laughs> His character knocks on Kira's door during the night, holding a boombox and a stack of cue cards. He points his finger on his lips, indicating for her to be silent, and reveals the first card, instructing her to tell her husband slash his best friend that it's just Christmas carolers at the door. Once she does, he turns on the boombox, which plays Silent Night, while he goes through the stack of cue cards. He professes his love for Kira and tells her the woman he has refused to ever speak to or spend time with, despite her repeated attempts to become friends that she is perfect this is fucking creepy dude and also she's your best friend's wife what the fuck? <laughs> as andrew walks away with his boombox and cards kira runs out and gives him a kiss before running back inside the moral of this story in fact most of the stories told in love actually is that stalking somebody is okay as long as you really really love them <laughs> It's fucking not. Stop it. In real life, you just come across as fucking creepy. Stop this shit. They'll probably even appreciate it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Don't do it. No. Romeo and Juliet. 
Simon may remember my feelings on this book and the infinite movie adaptations. Kevin thinks Simon has an excellent memory. He does not. <laughs> but now you all have to hear it too. Wait, Kevin, Kevin and I, we, you talk, told me about this like privately? I don't remember this at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet are heralded as the pinnacle of romance, despite being one of the least romantic stories ever. How many of you even remember the plot? It's pretty simple. 16-year-old Romeo goes to a party to try and win back his ex-girlfriend. While there, he sees this girl is 13 to 16 years old, depending on the version. Is like, damn, I did that. <laughs> it, Romeo. Don't be weird, Romeo. He goes up to her and asks, art thou DTF, fair maiden? What the f is DTF? Art thou DTF? I don't know, I don't get the reverence. She is. Oh, wait. Could that mean down to... It could, couldn't it? I don't know that one, but I get it now. She is, but this is the past to premarital sex isn't allowed not to be confused with the ancient past, which was just a centuries long orgy. The next night, they hold a secret wedding, before which the priest pulls Romeo aside to ask him, "'Tis true, fair Juliet's posterior doth fill her breeches marvelously, and she doth possess a bosom which not even the most formidable corset could contain." Not appropriate, dude. Not appropriate, what are you saying? But wert thou not trying to moisten thine loins beneath Rosalind's frock this evening past? Not appropriate, what are you saying? I know what you're saying, but it's weird. Romeo tells him to shut up and make with the ceremony. Yeah, fuck Romeo, I'm kind of... I mean, I know Romeo's weird, because he's like, I'd be down, but it, and she's very young, but... This was like, why is everyone is inappropriate? Romeo and Julia quickly get married, they have sex, and then they kill themselves because of their own stupidity. The end. There is no courting, no romance, just a quick hello, get married, and die. Yes, very sad. Anyway, it got me thinking. The whole story takes place over the course of five days, does it really? When Romeo was looking at Juliet's limp body after she faked her death, I bet he couldn't even tell what color her eyes were. The moral of the story is you should always give in to your reckless impulses and base desires because there is nothing more romantic than literally killing yourselves over someone you just met for the first time less than a week ago. Seriously, how did the headline, Stupid Teenagers Do Stupid Stuff, get replaced with most romantic story of the past 2,000 years? It is incredible, isn't it? I know the past is a different time though, blah, 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 but... But really, how can this compete with movies such as Love Actually? I love Shakespeare, but I can't even with you people and the way you interpret this story. Agreed, what a weird story. I never realized it was so weird. Anyway, this has been uh, Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. We really want that? We want Bill Cosby out there, allegedly. Thanks, weird. It's, it's, it's Bill Cosby. Shit.